Where are you on Palm Sunday? Where are you? It talks about this, this Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. He, he's no, this is his week before he dies. He knows what, what the weekend holds for him, and yet he still proceeds. He still follows the game plan. And, 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 and it says that as he's coming to Jerusalem, that, that, he's, that there's a crowd that's, that's celebrating in Jerusalem at this time. That, that to, at this time, if you were a good Jew, there were three major holidays that you would, that you would travel back to Jerusalem for. Uh, there was Pentecost, there was the Feast of the Tabernacle or the Tabernacle, and there was Passover. And, and in, in Exodus chapter 12, uh, the Torah gives instructions, specific instructions about what's to be done during this celebration of the Passover. And, 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 and you know what they were celebrating. They were celebrating their, their release from Egypt, that, that, when, that when God told them to, 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 to slay a, a lamb without spot or blemish and put the blood above the door and, 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 and the death angel would go through the entire area. And if the blood of the lamb... Hallelujah. Was on the doorpost. And someone say anyone. Anyone within that home would be saved. The deaf lamb, the deaf angel passed over those that were covered by the blood. And so they were celebrating this, and they would celebrate this every year. And, 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 the, and the, this Passover, the timing was very specific. It was done on the 10th day of the first month. The first month was named Nisan. Not the car, but Nisan. And, and this, this date that, 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 that this was supposed to happen, on, on this particular day, uh, the, the children of Israel, four days before they celebrated the Passover, they were to select the lamb without spot and without blemish. And we see here, I just want to give you a little information as we go further. We see here that the fourth day before these, these individuals, the children of Israel, were to select this unspotted, this land without spot or blemish, was the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. The land that would be slain arrives for the entire people, not only of Israel, but for everyone, for you and for me. And, and as they're entering it, remember, we, we think, okay, we, this, this is a, let, let me say, this is a nice-looking crowd. You guys are a nice-looking crowd. If, 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 if I was to say anything, I would say, you guys are just, mwah, you guys look good. But, but, but think about this. Think about this. We, we just hear the word crowd. There's, there's no specific number that we can definitely place on it. But they say approximately at this time, there were approximately 256,000 lambs that were slain during this time of Passover. What does that mean? Well, approximately every lamb represented a household of approximately 10 people. So when you look at that number, approximately 3 million people were in Jerusalem. Someone say, that's a crowd. That's a crowd. We, we're not ready for that crowd here yet. But that's a crowd. And, 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 and as Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, okay, maybe a million slept in that day. But two, two million people lined the streets and, and were at the gates. And they were all screaming. We shouted Hosanna at the beginning. But can you imagine two million people? Shouting, Hosanna, at the same time, I'm pretty sure that the buildings would have to shake. I'm pretty sure that there was a rumbling that went through the entire area. As Jesus goes through and approaches the cross, the cross that he knew that he had to go to, the cross that he knew everything that would need to happen to him. And he approaches it. But the question here today, the question here today that I have for us is, where are you on this Palm Sunday? 
We see the crowd, and we're, we're going to pull certain individuals out of this crowd. But I want you to question yourself and say to yourself, where am I in this crowd? Where do I sit? Am I happy with the position that I am in? And if I'm not, God, take me to that place that I want to be, that I desire to be. Where are you on this Palm Sunday? Well, the first thing we're going to talk about the people. All right, but to talk about the people, we have to back up three verses. There were three, three actually individuals or, or groupings of people at this time in the crowd. In John chapter 12, verse number 9. And the first group, the first individuals were the seekers. Someone say seekers. In verse 9, the A portion, it says that when the large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came. When they, when they knew Jesus was coming, something was stirred within them and it caused them to come to where Christ would be. The seeker, the, 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 the one that was on the scene and their heart was driven by a spirit of jubilee. This probably was the majority of the people there, but, but they had some things mixed up. But they were seeking, they were chasing after. They knew the Messiah was coming, and so they were constantly seeking this Messiah. And so when Jesus was entering into Jerusalem, uh, they, they, they shouted out this phrase, this phrase that came from Psalm 118, 25 and 26. It says, the actual word Hosanna actually means save now. So what they were saying is, 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 is what this Psalm 118 says. Is, it says, save now, O Hosanna. I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now pros prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. This particular psalm, as they were crying this out, this psalm was a psalm that was connected usually to the Feast of Tabernacles, but was also connected to when a conqueror returned home from a victorious battle. Remember, when they were looking for the Messiah, they were looking for someone that was going to battle the Roman Empire. They, they, had, they felt as though they were wrong. They were in bondage under the Roman rule, and, and they were expecting this Messiah to come in the way that was different than how Christ actually came. Some of us are looking for Jesus and we're looking for him in the wrong way. In our minds, we think that he should come this way, but he's come that way. Is he still not Christ? We were thinking that he should, he should say this, but he's now said that. Is he not Christ? The ideas on on how he's come. The seekers, they, 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 they were looking for him. But, but what, what, gives me, what gives me pause and gives me a little refrain is the fact that not only the seekers, but even his disciples got it wrong. And if, if those 12 that followed him every day got it wrong, then... I don't want you to beat yourself up if you get it wrong also. But just have a heart to be a seeker. To say, yeah, I got it wrong. I thought, I thought this, but this happened. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The seekers. I'm, I'm pretty sure that it, it ached Christ's heart as he entered in Jerusalem because he, he, he knew that they hadn't missed it, but it didn't stop him from going to the cross. We have the seeker. But secondly, we have the sightseer. Oh, sightseer. In verse 9, the B portion, it says, watch this, that some came for Jesus, but watch this, not only on account of him, but they also came to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Some have heard about Jesus. They heard a rumor about Jesus, about what he's done or what he's able to do. And so they come just to, just to see if it's really true. They, they, they think they, think they want to be there, but, but their heart is driven by seeing a sign or a miracle. Let me share this with you. If you don't see one miracle or one sign in your life, 
will you still commit your life to Christ? If he doesn't show you one thing, is he still Christ to you? Or do you need to see that thing to take you over that hurdle? I pray that you don't. I pray that you're not just a sight seer who, who's looking to see that famous person, to, 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 to see that one that, that's larger than life. I pray that you're not in a crowd that, that's only there for a, an idea of, of sensation. If I don't feel like coming, if I don't feel the, 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 the chills up and down my spine, then I didn't have church today. You know, I, I come to church when I, when I feel good. Or, or watch this. I come to church when I'm feeling bad. When everything has happened and, and all the roads have closed and, and every bank has turned their backs on me, that's when I, you know what? I need to go to church. A feeling, a sensation. A sensation that probably had some of the sightseers saying Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest on Sunday, but then having them on Good Friday saying, crucify him. With the same mouth that they blessed, they also cursed. And lastly, the, the third type of person that was in this crowd that we see is the scoffers. In verse 10, it says, so the chief priest, so the chief priest made plans, watch, to put Lazarus to death as well. Meaning that there was somebody else that were trying to put to death as well. The Pharisees, who should have been excited about the Messiah coming, they were frustrated. They were upset. They said that the whole world was going to go after him. The people that saw every prophecy in the Old Testament that being fulfilled should have been the ones excited like, this is him. This is the one that, that we've been reading about. This is the one that's been promised to us. They should have been excited. But they were scoffers because it messed up their agenda. It messed up their game plan. I, you know, I, I, I love movies. I love movies, and I haven't seen it, but you know that movie where you see the, the husband and wife, and they're, they're walking down the, the aisle, and they're, they're, they're about to say, I, I don't ever say this when I do weddings, so if you want me to do your wedding, just know I don't, I don't say, and if anyone has anything to say, mm -mm. no, you should have said it by then. And you see that person keeps saying, I love her, and she can, no, you should have said it. When you had the chance. But there's some individuals that, that are like that. They, they see that happening and, and they want to put a wrench in it. When they should be applauding, happy, encouraging us. Those are the three type of people. So I'm asking you the question today. Where are you on Palm Sunday? Are, are you a seeker? Are you a sightseer? Or are you a scoffer? I can't answer that question for you. Those online, I can't answer that question for you. But, I, but, but what I can say is that if you're in any category outside of the seeker, you have an opportunity today to say, Christ, I want to be a seeker. I want to chase after you. I'm not happy where I am. And I want to, I want to, I desire to be a true follower of you, Christ. So the people we have first, but next after that we have the personalities. The personalities. You know that we have personalities, right? We, we, we all have different things that we like, different things that we don't like. There's certain people that will speak up in the middle of a meeting. Some people will hold their tongue to the end and write you a letter. There's different personalities. There's some people that are very confrontational. There's other people that are not as so much confrontational. There's certain personalities. But what type of personalities do we have in this crowd? Well, first, the seekers, I call them having active faith. Now, now this is normally good, an active faith. They recognize Jesus as their Savior, as their Messiah, and they seek after him. They chase after him. This is a good thing, but it can be a bad thing at the same time as a seeker. Because if you're a seeker and you're seeking the wrong 
thing. That's when those seekers make a wrong turn. You're a seeker. You're chasing after Christ. But you're saying, God, your word said that you would give me the desires of my heart. Everything that I ask for is mine. You're wrong. I was speaking with uh, Neon last week, and she said she, she had never thought about it when we were preaching. It, it's not that he'll give you the desires of your heart. It's that he, he will give you. He's going to give you those desires for your heart. As a true seeker, that's what we pray for. God, give me, my, give me those desires that you have. Place those things on my heart that burn and ache your heart. God's not a vending machine. And, and I pray that's not what you're looking for today. When you pick and choose health and wealth, prosperity, money, riches. I'm not saying that believers can't be rich. We need some affluent rich people in our. But what if, and I share this before with many of you, what if God has for you as a single person a one-bedroom apartment and a humble car? Are you happy with that? Are you happy? Or are you seeking after something that's really not? For you, this active faith seeker, not trying to put Jesus in a hole or trying to fit Jesus into your box. The, the, the sightseer, that's the person that, like I said before, has that sentimental faith. These are the same people, like I said, that, that praise them on Sunday, but something happened. The tables turned, and on Friday, they now scream out. Crucify them. These are individuals that are led by their emotions. I don't know if you know anyone like that. They, they, they follow the, the idea that, and, and, and I've, I've witnessed this. There was a time that, that we would have like crusades and, and revivals, and they would scare you. They would scare you to salvation. I'm, I'm serious. You're going to hell. You are going to hell. You are going to hell. I don't want to go to hell. But have you touched that person's heart to make them want to have a change? It's, it's, it's a feeling. It's a sensation. It's, it's, it's salvation based on emotions. It's a life that has no spiritual backbone. It's worship based on feelings. I, I, I praise him when my favorite song comes on. I, I worship him when I feel that I'm led to worship him. No. It says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And as far as I can see, let me check to be sure. Yeah, you all got breath. There's no need for a sensation. It's not coming to church to get your fix. That I run to Sunday to just praise it, but on Friday, it's a whole different story. I pray that you're not a sightseer. With, with, with faith that's based on feelings and sensation. And the scoffers have, there's no faith connected with them. Their major problem is because they, they, they scoff at Christ. Christ isn't enough. Sometimes I can't see it, so I can't believe it. But that's not how we roll, Brother John, is it? It's the idea that, that, that yes, Christ is, it's not that he's not enough, he's more than enough. And he has to be more than enough for you and me. It's the idea that I'm trusting in something bigger than me. I'm trusting in a God that does exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ever ask and think. Listen, last week there was a person in the body that was in need. And, and so I, I, I prayed and I asked you guys, to, to we had a dollar amount. I want to share with you right now that we over exceeded that dollar amount. About we serve a God that does exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever ask and think. But we gotta have faith. Faith. You gotta have faith. What's faith? What's faith? 
I'm so glad you asked, Chris. James chapter 2 describes three types of faith that, that, that sometimes rampant and grow in our lives. James chapter 2. It, it first, he tells us that there's a thing called dead faith. Dead faith in verse 17. It says, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Where are you on this Palm Sunday? Do you have dead faith? He said not only there's dead faith, but there's the demonic faith. In verse 19 through 20, he says, you say that you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Watch this. Even the demons believe this and they tremble. How foolish. You can't see that faith without good deeds is useless. I call these people the, the you know, the, the spiritual people. You know, that I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know. I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I, I know there's a creator. I'm, I'm spiritual. Even the demons know that there's a God, there's a creator. But the last one is a dynamic faith. And this is the faith that I pray for every day in my life and the life of those that I know. Verses 21 through 22, it says, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the offer, altar. Verse 22. You see, his faith and his actions work together. His actions made his faith complete. Our dynamic faith is our faith and our deeds working together hand in hand. Remember, this is not a saving faith. This is a trusting faith. Faith. This is a faith that says, God, I, I trust your promises. I trust your word. And now I'm going to do what you told me to do. I'm going to go where you told me to go. It is difficult for me, even to this day, to think about how hard, how difficult it was for Abraham to go home and tell Sarah, pack up, baby. We are moving. Where are we going? I don't know. How long are we going to be going? I don't know. But it takes dynamic faith. Watch this. For Abraham, but we don't talk about Sarah much. Just say, okay, baby. Let's back and let's go. So my question once again for you is where are you on Palm Sunday? Because we have the people, we have the personalities, but we have the promise. We have the promise that, that Jesus, that he made, that he claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the Messiah by his actions. That's a promise. He fulfilled the promise and the prophecies that were made for him along in what he did, but also what he was about to do. Isaiah 35 tells us, it says he's coming to save you. And when he comes, watch this. This is what the prophecy tells us that the Messiah would do, that he will open the eyes of the blind. Unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer, and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Jesus did every one of these things. He fulfilled every prophecy and the prophecies that were to come. Him riding into the city on a donkey was a miracle in itself. He asked for, watch this, if you read, he asked for an unbroken colt. What does that mean? Why does that have any significance? Well, I don't know if you've ever seen a cartoon called Spirit, but it's about a horse that's unbroken and only one girl can ride him. It takes a lot to break a horse, they call it, to get on the back of it. It kicks. It doesn't want to go in that direction. That's a miracle in and of itself. But when you watch this, as they lay down the coats in the palm, it's not natural for a donkey to walk over those things. But yet and still an untamed donkey that had never been broken, never been ridden, was ridden by the Savior into Jerusalem. Jesus was fulfilling prophecy at every point, showing that he truly was the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Not only did he claim by his action, but Jesus claimed to be Messiah by what he, by what he brought. He brought this thing called peace. We call it the peace that passes all understanding. And how did he do that? He came as a king. 
Now, when, when most kings roll towards another kingdom or into a, a location, the, the thing that they wanted was war. And a king would indicate that war was either about to come or was coming that day is that they would ride into that place on a horse. A king on a horse gave the indication that war was coming. But that's not what Jesus came to bring. Jesus came to bring peace, and that's what kings did at that time when they rode donkeys towards a township or a village or a city. He declared that I did not come with a sword, but I've come to bring peace. I don't know how much peace you need in your life, but, but for me, see, I'm, I can't say I'm, I'm one of those weirdos. I like sitting in silence. I love sitting in silence sometimes, especially when I'm studying. I may put a little music behind at time, but for the most part, I like sitting in silence. That brings me peace. Some people get peace by cleaning. If that's you, come on over to our house. Amen. Me and my wife will appreciate you. Our house is clean, but there's one less thing that my wife has to do. Some people get peace by reading. Some people get peace by walking in the walking in nature, riding their bikes. But Jesus brings a peace that passes all understanding. He brings a shalom peace, a peace that, that God created at the beginning for us all. It says, Jeremiah 33, 6 is, nevertheless, the time will come when I will heal Jerusalem's wounds and give it prosperity and true peace. True peace. There's a manufactured peace, but there's also a true peace that I believe. I, 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 I've, never, I've never shared this, but I believe that, that as Peter got out of the boat in the middle of the storm to walk on water, that there was a peace within Peter that passed all understanding. How do I know? Because he was able to go beyond what his mind said he could do. And he was able to walk to Christ in the middle of a storm. Peace, true peace. Isaiah 9, 6, that we normally say at Christmas time. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and we shall call him Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And therefore, because he does all these things, and what he did and does, and, and what he brought... Jesus came as our Messiah this and every day because of what he does. What does Jesus do? He brings salvation to everyone. Romans 1.16, this is my life verse. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why did I pick this? Because when I first became a believer, at times I was ashamed to share with individuals about me being a believer. I, that wouldn't be the first thing out of my mouth. And so I proclaimed by my life verse that I would not be ashamed. He said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He brings salvation. 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for you and me. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. You don't become the righteousness of God because of yourself. You become the righteousness of God in and through Jesus Christ. So again, I'm asking you the question, where are you on this Palm Sunday? Do you have the faith of, a scoff, of the scoffer that, that doesn't quite understand or, or sure that Jesus' promises are true? Are you the sightseer that, that's not really concerned about anything else than a feeling, an emotion, or are you a seeker? It, you, may, you may not be quite sure that Jesus is going to fulfill those promises. And there's times that, yes, I do get a feeling, but at the center of it all, you are passionately seeking, searching, chasing after God, no matter what circumstance or si situation may come. Where are you? Today on, on this Palm Sunday, we're worshiping him. We're, we're welcoming him. We're calling on the name of Jesus. But I, I want to 
press just a little further into this. Is that okay? I'm, 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 I want it to be uncomfortable. I do want it. Because I want you to be challenged. So not only are, where are you today on Palm Sunday, but where will you be on Good Friday? Where are you going to be on Good Monday, Good Tuesday, Good Wednesday, Good Thursday, Good Saturday? Or is your faith only good on Sunday? Is this the only time that someone would know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? Will you be at the foot of the cross with those that had determined in their hearts that they were going to follow Jesus to the very end? Where are you? And where will you be? Are you walking off? Are you walking away from Jesus? Are you afraid? Are you hiding? It depends on these three things. This is where we end. The first thing we talked about, it depends on our crowd. It's important for us to look to see and consider the, the crowd that we've elected to travel with. We're influenced. I know you don't think so, but we're influenced by the people that we surround ourselves with. My mom said it best. Birds of a feather flock together. Show me the people that you hang out with, and I can, I, I, I can, I can tell you a good idea about who you are. The idea that, that the group will sometimes influence us. This, this group will, will sometimes cause us to, to stay on the path. Where are you today? What's the crowd that you're with? Is it a crowd that's going to help you stay on track with Jesus? Or it's a crowd that once things go wrong, they're the first one to say, I told you. I told you. I tried that Jesus. Now come on out. Or are they going to say, no, let's pray together because we're going to get this thing right. Your crowd, is your crowd a crowd of, of corruption like on Good Friday? Or is your crowd a crowd of celebration like on Palm Sunday? What's your crowd? 1 Corinthians tells us this in 1533. He says, don't be deceived. Watch this. Evil company corrupts good habits. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a... I'm going to save them. Well, you better be sure whether or not you can handle it or not. Because it's evil company. I'm not saying that you're going and you're speaking. I'm not saying to, to how, can, how can those who don't know Jesus be saved if we don't engage them? But company means this is, these are the individuals that you spend the majority of your time with. Evil company corrupts good habits. Psalm 1, 1, I love this. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. And this quote, there's a quote by a man named Booker T. Washington. He says this. He says, associate yourself with people of good quality. I love this. For it is better to be alone than in bad company. Where's, who's your crowd? Secondly, our hands. What's in your hands? The crowd in, in, in Jerusalem, they, they, on, on Sunday morning, they, they were waving palms. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Oh, he's the greatest. Oh, he's the best. Oh, he's the Messiah. He's awesome. Honoring Jesus. And then the majority of them came back on Good Friday with swords and clubs. Matthew 26, 55 tells us that. Then Jesus said to the crowd, another crowd, the crowd, am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? The same hands that held palms on Sunday now held swords and clubs on Friday, what's in your hands? Are you holding something in your hands that's doing harm to Christ? Or are you holding something in your hands that brings honor to him? What's in your hands? And lastly, our shout. The 
confused. What am I shouting? The crowd all cried out, Hosanna, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Everyone probably didn't really recognize what that really meant, that they really were speaking to the Messiah. Some of them were just saying it because the crowd were saying it, but the idea is what are you saying out of your mouth? Jesus warns his disciples in Matthew 12. He says, but I say to you that for every idle word man may speak, watch this, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Every word out of your mouth. Would you, mean, Pat, you mean just the words I, I say to fellow Christians? No, every word out of your mouth. Well, you're not talking about the times where I, I talked about that person behind their back. Every word out of your mouth. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, watch this, you will be condemned. What are you saying out of your mouth? What's the shouts coming out of your mouth? Are you considering what you're shouting, what you're speaking, what you're saying? Are your words, crucify him, crucify him, or are your words, Hosanna, save now? Where are you? this Palm Sunday? Where will you be on Good Friday? We're going to be right here at last 7 p.m. You're not going to miss it. That was your opportunity. But really, I want you to challenge yourself. Say, pray to yourself, where am I? Where am I? What, what crowd am I in? What's in my hands and what am I saying? The crowd that was shouting harm to Christ, they were in objection to us celebrating Jesus as opposed to celebrating Jesus as the object of our celebration. Jesus being the center of it all. They held in their hands things that would do harm to Christ as opposed to things that bring honor to Christ. They gave off shouts of rejection as opposed to shouts of rejoicing. Where are you on Palm Sunday and where will you be on Good Friday? Is there anything that can make you change your heart, what you're feeling, what you're thinking? Or are you determined to say, Christ, I'm going with you to the very end? No matter what goes on, no matter what happens, whether I think that it should have happened that way or not, I still battle with the fact that God, my, my dad's gone. I didn't want it. I didn't like it. I'm still trying to realize this new norm, but God, I trust you. I trust you more than my feelings. I trust you more than my emotions. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you, God, because we want to be challenged. We want to be pressed. We want to know without a shadow of a doubt that, God, I'm chasing after you. And, God, no matter what happens, no matter what may come, I choose you this day and every day. Things are going to get tight. Things are going to get rough. But Jesus, I choose you. Not just on Sunday. Not just when things feel good or when things seem right. God, I choose you in the midst of my storm. So God, I pray that whether it's a true Palm Sunday type of day, or whether it's a good Friday where, where it seems bleak and hard. I trust you. Now the hard part is that for you to get there, for you to get to that point, you have to give your life to Christ. You have to say, Jesus, I give my life to you. 
We here call it, we call it the ABCs. You first acknowledge, I say this all the time, that we are broken people living in a broken world. This is not the world that God intended for us. At the very beginning, when God began to create, he said, it is good, it is good, it is good. He created things that were good, and because of the sin of Adam and Eve, things were broken. And because that broken world, and because the sin that Adam and Eve created, we are broken people, now living in this broken world of sin, disease, death. So first we acknowledge that. If you can't acknowledge that you're broken, then I pray that God would bring you to the point that you would see it. That you see your depravity. But not just A, acknowledge it, but B, believe. You believe that God is not left. He does not want you in that broken state. You believe that he sent his son Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that was slain for the sins of of the world, the lamb that was without spot or blemish, the only one that could save the world. That you believe that God sent him into this world to die, to go to a cross that was meant for you. To die a death that was meant for you. But he did something that we could not do. He rose from the dead. Well, three days later, with all power in his hand, to believe that God did that, for you and for me. And then lastly, see, you confess with your mouth. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He saves you from that destiny. You now have your name written in the book. But also, he's your Lord. Now he tells you, he directs you, he guides you as your Lord. If you want to make that decision today, raise your hand, stand up. I will come off this stage. I will hug you. I will pray that prayer with you. And we will give you some resources and give you the things that you would need to continue on that walk. Salvation. It's never too late. If you have breath in your lungs, you can make that decision. You can make that choice. If you're online and you want to make that decision, you just, just type it in the, in, in the comment section. Pastor Larry, I want to give my life to Christ. We'll send you the things that you need. And I would love to talk with you and pray with you and celebrate because the Bible says that, that angels celebrate at just one coming to the Lord. And secondly, I know there's some people here hurting in pain. Some people watching online, there's some decisions that you have to make. There's some crowds that you're going to have to remove yourself from, and you need the strength of God to help you do that. If that's true, just slip your hand up so that as we pray, not only me, that you, you submit yourself to God. I see that hand. Amen. That, that you, I see those hands. I see that hand. I see that hand. Yes. Amen. I see that hand. I see that hand. Say, God, I need you right now. I, I need to make a choice, and it's, it's hard. I don't want to do My flesh doesn't want to let me do it, so I need your strength. Let's pray. Lord God, you know us better than we know ourselves. So God, I pray that you would just, that you would come in, God, and that you would help us, God. That you be our very present help in our time of need. But God, for those hands that were raised, God, you, you know what those individuals are in need of, God. And I thank you for them submitting themselves to you. You're saying, God, I, I invite you in to this situation. I invite you in to this circumstance, God. Now, God, I pray that you would just meet them, God. That you allow them to know that you, that you would never leave them nor forsake them, that even when they sit alone in a room that they've never, that they'll never be alone. I thank you, God, for this body here. Continue to use us, God. Allow this place to be a safe place for hurting people. For those that are confused, but those that are seeking and chasing after God. And for those that may not, God, allow them to feel welcome here so that they 
can hear your word so that a change can happen, God. So that their lives would mirror the life of your son, Jesus Christ. Now use us, God, and allow us to be used. We thank you and we praise you. And we ask these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. And the people of God say amen, amen, and amen. Let's give the Lord one more hand clap.